It is unlike yesterday where people had to survive for three hours, now you only have one hour, so it should, this is, should be easy. Uh, so what I wanted to talk about uh, is on the slide. Uh, for now I'm calling it docu-centric programming, and you'll see what I mean. Uh, but the subtitle is really, uh, yeah, all you really need is a proper editor. The thing is, most editors are not proper. but. Uh, in the, the, that is sort of uh, one of the themes here. And so uh, before we start, you know, it's good to be here. I, I come every six years even if I don't have to. <laughs> so uh, that's nice. But I realize this is not very polite, right? Because even though the language of the conference is English and all that, but really we are in Buenos Aires, so maybe we should say that, <laughs> right? And of course this is just a trick because this is one of my pet peeves, one of the things that always bothers me about presentation software, right? That you cannot edit the presentation when you're presenting, right? This is stupid. Microsoft has owned PowerPoint uh, for something like 35 years, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, you know, I don't know how much money they've poured into, but you can sort of guesstimate by what they kind of pay people, how expensive it is, and they run offices, and they've been 35 years, and they have huge teams, and they give out swag, and they have travel and all this thing. I don't know exactly, but it would not be far off that they may have spent a billion dollars on this thing over those 35 years. So one billion US dollars, and it still can't do this. So, uh, you know, and you, you could say that's a little unfair because you can do it if you're not in the presentation mode. If you're in the, the editing mode, you can do that, and you can still sort of see the slides. And nowadays people even do that because it interacts poorly with Zoom and they don't manage to get it to work all at once and it's all mainstream software. Uh, but, you know, it's, uh, this doesn't have a presentation mode, so, so uh, it's easy, right? Because there shouldn't be modes, right? That's one of the things that shouldn't exist. It should be modeless. So that solves the problem, but that's really only part of the problem because really why am, why am I writing this, why did I write this, this little uh, sort of presentation thing on my own, it's called Telescreen and if you know you're 1984 you know where the name comes from and uh, I did it for several reasons but one of them is right I need to demo Newspeak stuff and I want to demo it, I've always had this interest in, in literate programming and live literate programming so I want to demo it in documents in web pages and in slides and so forth. And so, uh, you know, maybe I wanted to do something like, uh, like this. Uh, hang on. So maybe I want to do things like this. I'm sorry, this is something I haven't, so it's really tiny. But there is a hello button here. <laughs> And it says hello. This is even tinier, but it says <laughs> it says hello Buenos Aires, and that that I that is a, this I can still fix. This I don't think I'll ever be able to fix because it's the the, the the modal dialogue of the of the operating system. But really, the point is that I can put in live buttons and I can edit in live buttons and or or general widgets into my slides. Right. That was sort of the important thing. Right? So all of this is just, uh, just a means to get us started for this discussion of, uh, of, uh, of the slideware and where it leads us. Right? Because I really want to show you my slides. And you say, well, you're already showing the slides. Well, no, but I really, really want to show you my slides. Mm -hmm. And this is my slide. Right? So again, you probably can't read that, but that is, God forbid, HTML. And that is the source for the slide. The thing is, I've done presentations before where I edited HTML by hand and put in, you know, things to, to have Newspeak code in it, but I got tired of that, so now I can actually do it interactively. But the point is, this is a, the, these, these documents, there's an editor where the model of this thing is the HTML markup. So if we, let's see if we can make it a bit bigger and see what we can see. Right, so somewhere in here, I don't know if you can see, but there should be, yeah, this is where it says hola. Right? I don't know if you can kind of make that out. Or is it even highlighted? Yeah, it's right there. 
sort of toward the bottom, right? So if I went and decided to say hello after all, right, this is the model, right? When I change that, I change the, the presentation, and it works both ways. If I go back, watch, watch that guy, right? So these two, the, the, the HTML is the model for, for this thing, so it dictates. And every editor has a model, but usually it's some data structure that you don't know. I think it's really good to have a markup language for that purpose. So there's something that you can see that is human readable, that has semantics, that you can search, you can manipulate. There are lots of advantages to using a markup language. Now, in a, a better world, I would have a different markup language. I have a, a pretty nice model for how, to, how a markup language should work with, with something like Newspeak. But I am only trying to boil one ocean at a time. I haven't had much luck with that. I'm certainly not going to boil the other one. So we're using HTML because that's the, the one that, that is out there. And, and that's a, one war I will not fight. So it's, this is an important point in itself. That that is, I believe, a, a correct model for an editor to have. That there's a markup, and you don't want to live with a markup all the time, right? You'd rather have an interactive thing. But there are things that are actually captured better by, the, by a markup which has a semantic structure, and you want this kind of coordinated view, right? Now, if you look, the other point about this, remember our button? We had this little button down here, uh, the hello button. And it's represented here by this thing, this div class ampleforth. Can you see that at all? Probably not, right? But this, let's, let's zoom in on the markup a bit. Is that workable? Yeah, OK. So right, this is a standard trick that people use with, with, with the DOM. We have these divs. They have a certain class. And then we can use the DOM API to search for them and Ampleforth, which is the name of the editor, and if you know your 1984 really, really well, you might know where that comes from. Uh, you probably don't. So Ampleforth, at some point, Winston, the hero, he gets arrested and he finds himself in, in a cell with a guy called Ampleforth, who also used to work for the Ministry of Truth. And Ampleforth's job, his job before he got arrested was to convert old speak literature into new speak. Okay, so he was a literary editor that, was, that knew Newspeak. So we have a literate programming editor, and it's called Ampleforth. The point being that uh, Ampleforth here can look for these divs, or not necessarily divs, spans, whatever, nodes that have a class, right? And then identify that's, that's things it needs to look at. And there's a name here. A na the name attribute is say hello. That's what we typed in. Remember when I started, I typed say hello. And this is a unary selector. What will happen here is we will send this message. We will, get, we will basically take the text that we had, it, or that's in the name attribute of this div, and we will use it as a message send, which we'll send, which is supposed to give us back a widget that we can insert into the DOM. Okay? And who do we send the message to? Right? So that's a question. The message, uh, come on, go back to normal size. The message here. I don't know if you can see the menu, but it says inspect document object. So let's inspect the document object. The document is, of course, an object. And now we have an object inspector on the document. This is stuff up here is object inspector stuff. If I press this, there are things like slots and their values, what you usually see in an object inspector. Right? We can make this a bit bigger again. Uh, not that big, maybe. OK. Right, anyway, you can see it has slots. It's an instance of documentric slide two, doc, docucentric slide two. Docucentric is the name of the presentation. I give them names for each slide has its own class. And that class has messages, so it supports say hello, right? So if I open the class, I can look at the class in the context of the object, and here, here's say hello. And say hello returns a button named hello, and its action is to open up an alert that says hello, Buenos Aires, right? So that basically, that, is a, uh, that button is, a, is that method call actually returns me a button widget. And if I evaluate this thing here, right, I can evaluate it in the context of the method. And uh, oops, there we go. It's a button fragment. That is the Newspeak UI's uh, representation of a button. It knows how to turn itself into a button, you know, uh, a button element, uh, the DOM thing, so it'll actually display, right? 
doesn't matter. The point being that that's what it returns us. So when we get that back, we can do surgery on the DOM and insert it where that div was, which said ample forth, and we can put it into the context of the document. Right? So this lets us put arbitrary widgets into, into the document at, at any point, and that's kind of nice. And we do it, and every, every slide can have its own scope with its own messages for what, what I want to show, right? So we also had, uh, we also have uh, say hola, right? So if we, if we use say hola, let's go back. See, this is, this is the, this thing, the object inspector here. Uh, there are views. This is actually uh, an idea we, we wanted to pursue for a long time, and I finally got jealous of Tudor and his, his beautiful stuff and says we should have like object views. So they're not nearly as elaborate, but you can basically choose how to view. This is the basic view, which shows you an object with its slots. But this is a view that actually shows you the document again, right? So, so this is like the view we said here. And if we go and say something like, say hola, right? And what I want to do is actually show you the, I want you to watch this because it'll also, so what happened here? Uh, so far, we just have say hola, right? It's right here. So if I go and click on this and make it a, uh, sorry, the screen is like a bit too, uh, what am I doing here? Yeah, I need this, this toggle bar to be open. Make that an amplet. And I want you to actually see this. It'll, the button will turn up. So if I make it an amplet, do you see how that changed, right? The, the HTML source got edited to have a div in it. So it goes both ways. If you write a div in the HTML source, you will get an amplet. An amplet is a, a little live widget in the document. And you will get it if you type it in the HTML source or if you convert, you know, one of these things here. So now we have the hola button and it says hola, Buenos Aires, right? So this is, this is just the mechanics of how we, we can, basically, I can very cheaply utilize all the stuff in the web browser to produce an editor now this is the double-edged sword because this is using content editable and if you've ever worked with a web you know that that is a world of pain. And so it does a lot for you by itself but the minute you actually want to control it you're, you're up the creek without a paddle, right? So I'm not sure we'll continue with this but otherwise I actually have to write a whole editor, right? This, this does most of the work except it does funny stuff part of the time so, it's, so I'm not sure if I, either you, you make it do the right thing which is an enormous amount of work to figure out all the strangeness or you write your, anyway, it's complicated, but, but the principle of the thing is, is what we're talking about here. So basically, we can either insert them interactively or we can edit the, the HTML directly, right? We can go here and let's add a new uh, div, uh, an ample fourth div here. I'll copy that and I'll stick it in somewhere uh, like here. And we'll give it a name equal, say, hi, I think is the other method we have. And once we close that, we have hi. Oh, see, this is interesting. I don't know why it turned out to be this shape. But it works because we do have a say hi method up there. If we look, there's say hi. They're all the same except what they say, right? They say hi, hola, hello, whatever, right? Uh, if, we, if we choose to say, put something il else in here, let's say, let's say, right? Now, what's going to happen? <laughs> yes, yes. And you weren't even at the tutorial yesterday. <laughs> uh, yes, exactly. So here we have message not understood, and that's a link, and we get into the debugger. And then we can go and do the usual thing. We can go create miss, missing methods, say adios. And we can tell it to put in, you know, button, whatever, adios. Yes, go ahead while I'm typing and ask. Don't ask. OK, yeah, <laughs> just, just don't ask. Good idea. Right, action uh, alert. Right, and I think that's right. Turn that, and we go back. And uh, yeah, we have a button, adios. And it does, yeah, whatever, right? So 
basically, the, this document leads you into the ID when you need it, right? And the nice thing about this whole story here is that you can start with an editor and just edit, right, whatever you're doing, and then there, you can sort of gradually get into programming and it, and it connects you through this object inspector on document into the, the entire system. So that's kind of uh, the basics of how this whole, of how Ampleforth works. And, uh, okay, let's go back to our presentation somewhere, which was this guy, right? So this is the whole uh, slide, and let's go to the next slide, right? So, of course, the point here was li live literate programming originally, right? So it wasn't just to put buttons in slides, right, but to, to more generally. So here's another example that I've shown people. And again, the widgets are a tad on the small side, but we have this counter. And it has an increment button, and it's live, right? We can increment, we can decrement it, we can reset it, et cetera, et cetera. So that's done in a similar way. And, but usually the, the thing I really wanted to do with these sort of things, right, here again is, this is the code that defines this counter, right? And let's, we'll probably need to make it a bit bigger. Ah, come on, get bigger, right? So this is a method browser embedded in the slide, right? And the method browser, this, is, this is, shows you a bit of how the, the UI framework in Newspeak works. Basically, there's an internal DSL. These are all message sends, but they're kind of in, in a style that lets you define UI things. So there's a row, and the row has a label with the count, and there's a button named increment, and one named decrement, and one named reset. And each of them has an action that you know, tells the GUI that something is changing because it's reactive and needs to know that, so that then it'll make sure that everything gets updated and basically does the actual increments. Here, subject is a thing controller, right? So this is Vasily's uh, uh, version of model view controller, which is, in my modest opinion, the best one I've ever seen. Um, and so you have models, which are just models, and they don't know anything about the UI, and you have uh, subjects, which are sort of the semantics of the application. And you have presenters, which are the view, right? They present, they're the presentation, and the subject is the subject of the presentation. That's the actual logic of things. And the model is just some, some data somewhere. So, you know, well, it, it's sort of stupid to do this for a counter, but a well-structured thing has a presenter, a subject, a model. And so we basically, the, the, this, will, this code goes in the presenter, and it basically calls the subject and says, oh, give me the count, give, uh, please increment, whatever. So if you have a more serious application, it makes it more sense to separate these things out, okay? The nice thing about this is, okay, let's try and make it a little smaller so we can see at least that much, right? Is, of course, that let's say I don't like these names. These names make sense. But let's say I'm a real programmer. So I want to say things like this. So I want terse, inscrutable, unreadable stuff. So if you were a real programmer, you would have put flat, flat, and minus, minus. Sorry. <laughs> Spoken as a real programmer. <laughs> uh, yes, well, I'm, I, I, I am not a real programmer, but I play one on TV, right? <laughs> so if we accept this, Right? Now we have, this has changed. So this is live. This is like a, a, a proper environment in your slide, and so you can do nice things. And of course, the key thing is, right, it still says five, right? We preserve the state of the counter, because the whole point is, why, why do you care? Otherwise, you can, you know, you can compile it and restart it like the rest of the world does. And the point is, you don't want to have to get back to the state, because getting from zero to five is easy, but in a real application, getting to the state is complicated. So this is, this, so this works for, interesting essays on, uh, on live programming or things like that. So that, that was sort of my original made motivation for this stuff. Uh, but of course, this goes way beyond slides or, well, or even beyond literate programming because once you have this, you realize I use, I don't know, half a dozen or a dozen applications that are all the same stuff and they're all different, <coughs> right? There's editors like programmers editors, right? And we can, we can argue to death over VI versus Emacs and all that stuff. And there's word processors, which are editors that just make things nicer but, and don't usually have the nice affordances for syntax coloring or whatever. But basically, they're text editors. And then there are note takers, which you write small pieces of text called notes, and they save them for you. And there's 
Twitter clients or whatever where you type this and you, there's messaging apps like WhatsApp and, and uh, Apple's messenger thing that sends SMSs and they go on and on or uh, and then there's presentation managers and there's blog thingies and what have you and they're all kind of the same yet they're all different and why should they be right so a few examples of this I think I have one already open here uh, yeah, this is a blog post I wrote about this stuff a, a, a few weeks ago. And so, again, it's, it's, it's rich text and it has inside it, it has an embedded document. This is called, uh, there, there are a handful of researchers who work on this area, and this is called Transclusion. There's wonderful work from uh, 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 some people in Denmark, uh, and they, uh, they coined this term. And so, uh, you know, we have a little essay here, so, so this is a blog post, so it's deliberately now rendered dead, right? Basically, you switch one content editable somewhere and the whole thing so, so that you, it, it's, it's just sitting there, right? But embedded in it, this one is editable, right? So this is an embedded document of the same kind, and we can yeah, it has a thing here, and we can do things like uh, we can stick in a, an amplet here, right? I think this one was the one that we were using. Make it an amplet. You have this button, press me. You press it, and it tells you that Big Brother is watching. Okay, <laughs> so uh, the so 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 there's all these applications which would benefit for having some sort of uh, some sort of interactive capabilities. Uh, first of all, you'd like the, just something that was flexible enough so that one, the, they're all doing the same kind of editing. And then, okay, if they're actually flexible and programmable, you can start adding, oh, this one has to send messages over this protocol to, uh, you know, WhatsApp and one or, or Facebook's thing or whatever, and this one has to send email and whatever. But really, what's the difference, right? Why, why should I cope with, with all of these things? So that's another, like, pet peeve of mine. And it's something for the small talk community to consider, like, maybe it would make sense to actually build something mundane and useful and smuggle the thing through that. Because you, everybody can write an SMS and put in, they all know how to stick an image in it or a video in it or, or, a, or a meme, gif kind of thing, right? And then they'll learn that they can actually put in a button that does something for them and then they'll, you know, maybe, maybe there's a path forward here, right? Uh, going back to our presentation, this was another one. So where did it go? Which tab was it? Yeah, so this is, this is a paper that I'm presenting it live next month. It also has your same counter and the same transcluded thing because uh, I'm too lazy to do new examples. But this uh, essentially it's out there on the web and this is a paper that kind of explains some of the, the stuff that I'm talking about or at least some of it. So this is, so I can, I can write actual sort of semi-decent papers, at least in terms of their formatting, right? The content, well, what can you do? Uh -huh. But uh, I can write blogs, I can do slides. So this is, this is sort of generally useful. Now, nobody except me can probably use this stuff at this point because there are glitches and issues and what have you. Uh, I, was, I was tweaking this presentation software on the plane uh, coming in here, right? So, so it, and we have these methods, counter value, all these things that are amplet so that we can actually get widgets out of them. So, Counter value is a label with a, with a printout of the counter, right? And uh, decrement and increment, you can figure out. There are these buttons, and they're, they're very similar to the buttons we had before, except we don't have a subject and all this model view controller stuff. We just subtract, you know, we just do it directly on the counter. And similarly for the increment and reset, they all do this, right? So all of them do either you know, they decrement the counter, they decrement it directly by assigning the counter, counter minus one or counter plus one or setting it to zero, right? Now, the nice thing about this is if you're, if, if you're starting to program, you really don't know, have to know this story about model view controller because that's not an obvious story, right? Some very smart people many, many years ago came up with this scheme and it's a great scheme in terms of the software engineering properties and it's separating the presentation from the da-da-da-da-da-da. Humans don't want to know about this. 
And so they, you know, they can get started with something that's very concrete. Another thing this does, these documents do, which uh, I'm, I'm sort of uh, not too proud of, but kind of, is that they bypass uh, a lot of the, the Newspeak sort of scoping restrictions and modularity rules because, again, there's a, the same trick as with the workspaces. So you can get all kinds of names conveniently. Now, eventually, you can evolve this, right? You can, there's nothing that prevents you from actually having a subject variable here and having a real subject where, with the logic to do this and, and separating it out. And so you can take this and gradually structure it into a real application if, you, if you're concerned with that sort of thing. But you don't have to do that. You certainly don't have to start by doing that. So that's kind of uh, a nice thing. And uh, so, th so this is meant to illustrate that, yeah, we really can build GUIs. Now you can say, ah, it's just a counter, right? What if you have something more elaborate? Um, I didn't get far enough. Uh, one of my, my original plan for these slides is there's a version of, uh, so, so we're using documents here inside for each slide. But the whole, the, the framework around it, Telescreen, is in fact still a regular application. Now, what I want to do, and that's not quite done yet because I, I didn't sleep enough as it is, uh, but I can make Telescreen a document, right? What is it? It's another document. It's, it's instead of just three buttons and a label, yeah, it has, you know, a toolbar and, and, a, and a sidebar and, and things like that. But, you know, I can paste them. Basically, I can do vertical orientation by, by sticking returns into the text, and I can do horizontal by putting spaces. And no, I may not get perfect grids. Then I can start actually putting widgets that, that are flexible things if I really get fancy. But basically, I'm arguing that you could pretty much get away with, with, with sort of the, the grid of characters that you're used to and replacing them with widgets. Uh, you need to improve things like uh, the sizing of things. So the widgets need to, to kind of get their formatting. And one of the things here, you'll notice, I can't, uh, this, this button works, right? So a button's an interesting one because it responds to clicks by, by doing the, its button thing. But in general, um, there, if you, there are widgets where you might be able to edit the text of, that's on the widget, which you don't usually want to do, right? Sometimes you want to do it when you're actually building the GUI, but often you don't. Now the nice thing about this, nice, you can debate nice, but unlike Morphic, which is a thing of beauty in itself, we don't have the problem that people accidentally mess with this, right? If you actually want to, to really, uh, you know, destroy things, well, you should have an undo because I can destroy some things, right? I can go here and, yeah, if I accidentally, right? So they're, they're basically, like any good editor, if this was a real editor, we'd have an undo button and, and they'd come back, right? Uh, yeah. Ah! And we'll kind of put this back and hope for the best. And I hope it's still working. Come on. So where's our tech guy who knows whether this is really working? It's working. Yeah, it's working. Yeah, Good. It okay. Oh, you're the tech person. Okay. <laughs> not the tech guy. But yeah, yeah, not a guy. Sorry, I didn't. I, I was thinking of him. I didn't. I didn't even realize you were out there. Sorry. Don't worry. Uh, let's see. So where were we? Uh, basically, if you really want to mess with this, right, one of the things we do is, well, you can't actually see it here because we, we preserve the original divs that say Ampleforth in the source, right, even though the DOM is, has changed because the DOM has the actual tree for, for the widgets. Now, I stick a content editable false on them so that they won't be editable so you don't go mess with your internal components, unless you want to, which then you basically have to go and uh, there has to be an affordance to do that, right? I, I can edit this HTML raw directly. But this is not something that someone can press by accident. I still remember the way back when we were working on Newspeak the first time when, when we, had, uh, we were actually selling, developing a product and, and we had someone go out to, to the, the people who were actually willing to pay for the first version and she did a dry run of her presentation and she stepped on her slides because, yeah, because we, we had shut down most of Morphic when we had forgotten one place. And then she, she suddenly, it didn't work because she was, she was editing the slide instead of actually type making it do its thing. So you really don't want that to be inadvertent, right? So Android has this thing where you, there's some things you can do only if you press something seven times. Literally, I'm not making this up. 
So that so it's really if you want to edit it, you know, you have to know this in the in the, and you know, if you press this click seven times, then you get into some mode where you can do some some strange thing to to the UI. To enable developer mode. Yeah, whatever it's yeah. So the point yes, the point being that you want you don't want it to happen by accident, so you make it really obscure. So this is, I think, a better, better solution, right? If you, if you know enough to open this side view and start editing the HTML, then you probably do know what you're doing and, and you want to, to change it. But you, you, you can't do it inadvertently, right? You can only do it inadvertently in the terms of actual editing operations, which should be undoable just like any other editor operation. So this is, is kind of uh, nice. And yeah, here's a conventional counter. That's the one that we saw embedded in the first slide. And it has all this stuff. Let's just go to the counter UI and right and make it look right. So there's a, a this is a counter UI a module, and it has a counter presenter. And inside there is a, is a definition method we saw earlier, right? And you'll notice because we changed it over there, this is the real the counter that, and it says plus one minus one right, right? Because we did change it, right? And it has all kinds of boilerplate that. That's that the UI framework works. So there's all se separately. There's a subject with this logic, and there's actually counter objects, which are the models for these things, which are just a box with an integer in them, right? So if you really know how to program and you understand the UI, you know all this stuff, and you could evolve the thing we just did in the editor into this for for real application. But again, my point is, you don't have to know all this stuff, right? You can just run an editor. So. We've really gone beyond slides here because we have, very much as with Morphic, we have this idea that the GUI is the GUI builder, right? Which is a beautiful idea. It's modeless. And because it runs on the web, it's also a web page builder. And it's, it's an editor, and it does all those things. Fundamentally, that's what your editor should be able to do. And now, because we're tied to the ID so we can program these things, we have a complete ID. And yeah, another exercise that should not be very difficult to do, and if I had more time, I'll eventually do it probably for, for the next time I present this stuff in a month or so, of uh, computational notebooks. What's a computational notebook? It's just, it's really just one cell after another with some text, and you know, it shouldn't be very hard to, to set that up as a sort of simple application of this stuff. Except that it won't have the problems that computational notebooks do because you'll be able to control the ordering and you'll be able to save this and you'll be able to, to put it in source control. You know, there are all these limitations that they ran into because they're, they're these hardwired little things that someone did in Python. And, you know, what that does to your the tunnel vision that, that, that whole world, you know, gives you. Uh, so, yeah, we can, we can do a lot of stuff with this thing. And uh, it just needs, you know, polish. So basically, the argument for docu-centric programming is that documents are natural UI. Everybody can edit text, almost everybody. Everybody can edit an SMS, right? By the time they're six or seven, and really you could, tr you could teach them this when they were three. Uh, so this shouldn't actually come as a surprise to anyone, because if you think about it, you know, this is not my idea. The web is based on documents. First of all, it's not my idea because there's, there's interesting UI papers in, in, uh, from like 30 odd years ago, which basically said the same thing, right? Uh, but the web, right? The web, you can write arbitrary, pretty advanced applications in the web. And what is the web? The web is basically a mark, based on this markup language for, for documents. So it really shouldn't be surprising that you do it. But the web is, well, the web is, first of all, it's, it's geared toward passive users. So that's the other thing I want to, to harp on, right? That this expectation that, you know, what is the web for? It's for some people to sit in front of and watch advertising. That's, uh, that's what it's really for. And so that's, so it really doesn't encourage, right? It doesn't encourage editing. For, for starters, it has a built-in content editor that is the world's worst editor ever, right? That, and, you know, why didn't they, why did they already invest if, if a billion has been spent on PowerPoint on these web browsers, God knows what's been spent, right? Uh, and yet they, the editing is, this is the one part, the web has gotten a lot better at being consistent and actually implementing things. I've had very little problems across browsers. The one thing that behaves differently that really needs Chrome is, is this content editable stuff because that does different things in each of them. So it'll do most of the basics, but it won't do things like this. So this guy, if I say Apple B, 
I get, you know, I can bold things. So I have some functionality here that I can do automatically, right? It's built into the web browser. That's kind of nice. But that doesn't work in some other browsers, right? It's all a mess. Because really, they didn't think that anyone should be editing. If you edit it, oh yeah, set up source control, put your, your HTML files in Git. Da, 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 this whole horrible warped. Anyway, I, I should stop. Uh, and so that's basically passive users, right? And, and we'd like them to enable users to actually have some control over, over, over this stuff. The, and, and related to this, of course, is if they're going to do that, they, there needs to be real support for live programming. And it's, I don't want to say that it's not there at all, because JavaScript, it, I mean, I made it work, right? It is there somehow. But ju it, it's just so hard to do it, because it's not like out of the box. You can't, the idea, oh, you can reload the page. Fantastic, thank you, right? You can edit your JavaScript in some other text editor and then reload the page. And of course, the state of the application is gone and all these things. And you can't change the schema of the objects on the fly because you can't even find all the objects no matter what you do. And whenever you try to propose one of these features, they look at you and why would you want to do that? And it, it is really, really isn't set up to, to do this. So we need something more civilized on top. Yeah, and basically, <laughs> you know, uh, it's just, it's just ugly. It's just awful. <laughs> it's just a, a really, really nasty set of, of complicated, uh, taste-blind things that, you know, won the lottery by being in the browser. Uh, so, what more can I say? Again, I think I've sort of said this. In a sense, this has a low floor because you start with just an editor. You don't even need to know that it does all this stuff, right? It's an editor. Any, anybody can write a tweet and anybody will. And uh, on the other hand, yes, we can get to this full live IDE and you can write all kinds of stuff in it. And so this is a, a pathway and it gives people control over the, what they want. There's an argument that they don't want control, right? That was Steve Jobs point, you know, they don't actually want control, they want uh, you know, uh, what's the English for this? The, the phrase the Romans used at the Colosseum, bread and entertainment, bread and games, or there, there's a... Circuit. Yeah, well, it was a circuit, but there's, there's a two-word phrase, and I'm sorry, I only know it in Hebrew because that's the translation, but there should be, of course, if I was civilized, I'd know it in Latin. But anyway, <laughs> the, the point is, there is this outlook that just, yeah, the, they, the people don't actually want to control the computer, they'll, they'll do what we tell them to. Uh, this, in a way, is part of, you know, part of something, of a bigger picture of a path out of digital serfdom, because people are actually beginning to wake up and realize that there's a downside to all this convenience, right? And obviously you can see it needs tons of engineering to make it really, really good, and that, that's the easy part, that's just drudgery. Uh, what is a little more interesting and challenging is support for collaboration and backup and sort of cloud stuff, which is what I want to talk about now. Right, so this is kind of things that haven't been done. It's been, this, this thing has been future work for me for 17, 18 years now. So eventually I'll, I hope to get it done. So there's this idea I had of objects as software services. And, uh, and that by itself is a talk which I won't give here because we were mostly through the talk. Uh, I'm sorry, next. But the basic idea that I had, uh, I, uh, I'll tell this story again because probably most people haven't heard it here. In, on April Fool's Day 2004, Gmail was rela released. I don't know if that was deliberate or symbolic or what. But um, very shortly thereafter, I, started, I, I got to use it. Back then, oh, Google finally will solve my, my email problem, right? That was a point where everybody loved Google. They were full of pixie dust and people assumed that all they did was great because the search it was and is fantastic. And I said, ah, there'll be an email. And I used it for half an hour, and then I decided, nah. And it took me years to come back to it because, yeah, there's still no email that does what I want. But I did, it did, it really opened my eyes. Wow, you can do all that in a web. This big, complicated thing actually will work in a web browser. And then I started thinking, and I had this idea, well, why is it that I wasn't happy with Gmail? Because I wanted some of the stuff that the, the local apps can do, the traditional apps can do. At the same time, you know, for email, it's a sort of almost naturally connected. It has to connect at some point. But generally, this idea is that you want apps that behave like local apps, 
but also have the advantages of web apps, right? So web apps have a nice property that you don't have to install them. You don't have to update them. You don't have to worry which version. You don't call customer support and they ask you, are you on 3.2.5 or 3.2.8 or none of this, right? So they're always up to date. And they're always available in, in several senses. What does that slogan mean? It means they're available from anywhere as long as you have a network connection and a machine, any machine. And that's kind of nice. This stuff works on a phone, right? It's a little awkward to type, but you know, but it certainly works on a tablet. With a tablet, I have an iPad with a keyboard and you can do all of the stuff I've done here quite conveniently, right? And I didn't have to port it or worry about it. So there is this universal availability. And if I, it didn't bring my computer, I could borrow a machine from someone here and, and as long as I put it out there, right? So there's lots of advantages to that. But there's also another sense of always available, which is that even if the network isn't there, it's available on your machine when it's disconnected, right? If the network isn't there, or if the network is too slow, or if the network costs too much money, or if the network is just fine on your end, but you're connecting to this cloud server that is under a denial of service attack, or what have you, all, you know, anything that can go wrong, it still works because it's on your machine. And so that, that was kind of, uh, uh, that was actually the, the motivating idea for Newspeak, except that it's quite hard to pull off. And we built the language and everything first, and we were gonna tackle this, and then 2008 happened, and we lost all our funding. So anyway, uh, we go to the next slide, but basically why is this hard? Because of merge conflicts. Essentially what happens is now you have this thing that you're putting out on your machine and, and if you disconnect it's still on your machine. But you could be connected somewhere else or someone else could be connected if you're collaborating through this thing and it can evolve independently. And now you have multiple copies that may not actually be the same and when you get back online they have to be synced up, right? This is basically what, what Git does for, for source control, of course, it's programmers, they tolerate anything, and it's complicated and horrible and so forth, but the root of this is merge conflicts. So you need to, to sync them. And I'm gonna not, I tried to not say sync, I said sync for years, because for in a minute you'll see why I don't wanna use sync, I wanna use reconciled. But in any way, you have to go through this process of reconciliation, and one of the points that I am emphasizing is you need to reconcile both data and code. They have to go together, which of course not everybody agrees. So generally, this is part of a larger, uh, a larger uh, apologies to Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, so the, there's, there's this pendulum that goes between centralized and distributed computing, right? Once upon a time, there were these mainframes. My back in, in the dark ages of history, while Dan was inventing the future, I was, I was a teenager working on an IBM mainframe as an operator in the Stone Age, and, and it was only years later that I saw this unbelievable thing that, that they had done roughly at that same time. But these mainframes, right, there were these things that occupy a room this size with big thick cables under the floor connecting them and, and disks that are the size of refrigerators and all these things, right? And you had to connect, and, and the breakthrough was you had time sharing. You could connect to this from terminals and, and type and run multiple users, could use this at once. And they just then you'd have this university-wide network and connect to, to the computer and all that stuff. And that, it was called time sharing until well, then the pendulum, then there was personal computing that, that someone here and, and, and his colleagues invented. And the pendulum went back and we had these cool Apple machines and whatever. And then it started swinging back. There were things called X terms and thin clients and whatever and going back. And, and eventually there was, they were back to time sharing. It was called cloud because that sounds better. Right? But it's basically time sharing, right? On these giant data centers. But what are they doing? They're, they're time sharing. You're that whole, well, they're actually now many, many processes. It's gone hugely sophisticated. But basically, is it in some center somewhere or is it distributed under in personal machines that many people have and under their control? And it keeps swinging back and forth because there are trade-offs. So people are getting, I think peak cloud is finally over. People are getting fed up with the cloud again because what it leads to is a concentration of power, whoever has those centers, right? And if you've ever, I haven't yet, but after this talk, they'll be, they, they might, but uh, well, they have better things to do. But if you've ever been banned from Facebook because someone stole your credit, something went wrong, and then you find out that there's no one to talk to and no way to do it, 
Or if you used to have data on Google Plus, and then Google's promise is it's your data, we'll give you back your data. And if you ever got your data back and realized that there's nothing you can do with it because no one actually validated or tested this process and the links are all broken internally and it would take me days to actually turn this data into anything vaguely usable, then you realize that you cannot actually trust any of these people and you cannot rely on them to, to keep your data. Right? And so that is why people are beginning to, to think differently. So an interesting thing that's happened in the past few years is this thing called local first software, uh, which is a slogan, uh, Martin Kleppmann, I think, and his colleagues came up with this. They wrote a paper, and it's a very nice paper. And they, this clicked for people. They, em they emphasized every possible advantage almost of, of this thing. And even though I'd been talking about this for many, many years and no one paid attention, suddenly people paid attention to what they said. They said it better, they, they said it more clearly, and what the time was right. In any case, it's a little different, but their, their emphasis was that, yeah, it should run on your machine and you should own your data. And you, yes, you should be able to, to collaborate and, and sync, reconcile, whatever, but that's a, that's a, that doesn't mean that it should be under the control of this cloud provider of whatever it is, yeah, Google or Amazon or whoever, right? And partly they, they, the, the technology for dealing with these conflicts has gotten better. There's these things called CRDTs, conflict-free, uh, conflict uh, whatever, data types, what's the R? Anyway, uh, so that's a technology that sometimes works, sometimes doesn't, but certainly makes the the uh, problem more tractable. And, but all of this is about uh, data reconciliation. They don't really deal with code. That's one of the differences. Uh, because there is this trade-off. The, the, what I described still says that there's uh, someone you know, evolving the code. And one of the arguments they make, oh, if you do this this way, if you don't like a new version, you stay on the old one, right? your old version of whatever your application wanted, which is attractive, but also a problem. Because then how do you collaborate with a person who has updated their software? And, so forth. So I, I still think that we should actually automatically update. But anyway, uh, so it's really always available is, is, is they're, they're doing that, but they're not doing the always up to date. But really, the, part of the argument is they want peer to open, peer to peer pro protocols that could do this, even though in reality you're doing it. So you still want some centralized thing because when you synchronize, who are you going to synchronize with if, if the other person isn't actually online? And if they are online, why was there a problem synchronizing in the first place, right? So there needs to be some, you, you eventually want to have some party that's stable out there in, in the cloud that is running a server that you can synchronize with so someone can go later at some other time zone and synchronize. So, so there's still this need for these kind of, of hubs there. Anyway, local first software is a thing. There was a workshop at eCoop. Uh, it's really picking up steam. And so that's kind of, again, this, this battle for user agency and it's related. Why am I, what, what is the connection, by the way, to everything I told you before? Because that's what's, yeah, again, I, I said that. It's missing, right? So one thing PowerPoint, which I ragged on, will do for you is it actually is a sort of local first app. It'll, you can run the local uh, traditional PowerPoint, or you can run it in, in whatever it was, 365, Microsoft, whatnot, and, and it will sync it up and, and do things up to, up to a point. So they do, do interesting things, and, and we want, if we want this editor to really work for people, not for me, but even for me it would be convenient, right? Uh, I'm satisfied to do this just so I don't have to use the regular mainstream crap. But if I, if I want something that I could say this is really a valid thing for people to use, then we need to address this collaboration problem. Or, or and not just call, uh, backup as well, right? A reliable backup somewhere on the network. And so this is why I didn't want to use synchronization because otherwise I end up talking about synchronous and asynchronous synchronization. And asynchronous synchronization is really an interesting thing to think about. So it's re the reconciliation, there's basically two flavors. And uh, Vanessa will tell you much more about this tomorrow uh, because she's doing real work on this. But basically there is the synchronous kind, which is what Croquet does, right? This is real-time collaboration. And there's the asynchronous thing, which is what the local first are talking to about because that's that means you can be offline, right? If you're offline, Croquet kind of uh, has a mechanism for catching up, but if they're different, basically you, ca you cannot have variance. If, if you're offline, you can't actually change things in that model. You'll hear all about it tomorrow, but it's, it's a different thing. Uh, they're both useful for collaboration in different forms, and really we'd like to have both. 
So uh, yeah, this is our counter application again. And you notice now it's saying plus minus one because it's all going to the same counter. And, and actually this thing, I'm amazed, it actually is working and, and is updating because the slide, as I remember it, had, had the, uh, the names. But can we make the co this counter collaborative without changing it? Right? So I want that same counter code that I sort of showed you with a counter subject, whatever. Not the one I just made up in the document, though that too, that's the end goal. But I want this to be collaborative. So now I'm going to try something that has worked when I try this on my own, but of course it'll probably do something horrible when I try to do it now in front of an audience. But also you can participate if you have a machine and you have the patience to uh, get this URL, right? Because basically I have a counter app out on the network that is working through Croquet and lets everyone count together if, we, if we're lucky. Uh, now, this works a bit better in North America than here because I think the, the croquet reflectors are, are, are less uh, dense on the ground or something around here. It does work, but it's, it seemed a little sluggish. And sometimes it doesn't work because there, there, are, there are problems and that's not croquet's fault. The, because croquet does it through JavaScript and there's a library and you have to do it a certain way that it's designed to do. And what I'm trying to do is take my unchanged app that doesn't know about Croquet and have the platform take care of this. So if we go to this, uh, I actually have one of these open already. And let's see if it'll come up. Right, so there we have a counter. And we can make it bigger, hello, so you can see, right? So, and it's alive. The question is, is another one alive. So I actually have another one here somewhere. This is another one. And yeah, they're, they're in sync. So this is another croquet thing. Let me make it bigger as well. Yeah. The URL, yeah. Uh, okay, let's go back to the URL. Yeah, it'll be interesting if, if once we have several people, because now for, I have two, two, instant, two uh, copies on my machine. You can go to the Newspeak uh, site, go to demos. Yes, that, that'll get you most of the URL, and then all you have to do is um, snapshot equals croquet counter app. Do, no, you have to do two things. From demos, it'll get you to samples, and then you have to substitute all of this part, because it's not the same HTML page, and it's not the same snapshot. Yeah, because I don't actually have it linked in the sample. I mean, there's no link to it because it's so new and flaky that I don't, didn't want to put it out. Okay, so once you manage to get that, see if it works. Oh, someone, in, someone is at it. Yes. HTML. After the HTML, uh, question mark, snapshot equals, and croquet. Okay, let's, let's stretch this a little bit. Okay, but someone has gotten to it because someone is playing with it, right? I'm not touching this. Who, who's the guilty party? Aha, okay, yes. Hello, let's see now. The problem is, is, it, am I, is, is mine still working? Okay, this sucks. Let's see if that one works. Uh, not this one, this one. Okay, this one will come back and we'll see. They're probably not working properly and I can explain why. Because, uh, hello, okay, it's getting there, come on, why is it still blacked out? But it is alive, but they're not, they're not this one is, is kind of, yeah, uh, page unresponsive. Uh, well, let's see what we do if we, so this will get totally out of sync, because now it'll go back to zero probably, yeah, right, so this one's bad. And uh, if we're lucky, but, but you can see that at least some people have changed the one on my page. To get it perfectly synchronized, I can tell you what the problem is. The problem is that the real croquet doesn't want to keep your event history forever. And so once in a while they preserve your model so that when you come back online they will have your correct state. The problem is that that works if you do it through the JavaScript library and it's a, you inherit from their class model or whatever and I'm not doing any of that. I'm playing some nasty little game inside the Newspeak UI and that works for a short time until it has to actually refresh and yeah, it's kind of all whatever. This one's completely dead. This one is also not doing well. 
but you sort of saw that there's something going on there, right? It's interestingly, it's, it's yeah, what the hell is that? I don't know. And it's not letting me do anything, but it is showing different results. So you kind of get the flavor. This is not ready for prime time. As I said in the slide, it said I'm doing something crazy because I'm demoing something that I know doesn't work. Now, usually you demo something that you know works and it doesn't work when you demo it. So this is uh, double jeopardy, right? So the point is that is real-time collaboration. And the interesting thing here is that I believe if I had an image in this news, the Newspeak system, right? One thing I want to, all the things you're seeing here in the web browser, by the way, two minutes. Okay, we're going to go over time enough. Okay. Um, what's happening is this is all running in the browser locally, right? I mean, this, not, not the croquet stuff, but, but these slides are running locally, right? I don't have a server backing this, right? You can disconnect it, right? It's all running entirely in your browser. And we can, I believe we can get to a state where we can do this and the platform will do this for you, right? The platform is doing it for you and since we're out of time, I will not explain how it works because I do have a slide that tells you how it works. For the people who attended the Newspeak demo and were interested in why class hurricane Terence and using the platform as a first class object, both of the things are necessary to do this because this, this Croquet app is working with a different version of plat the platform object and it's tied to a different version of the Hopscotch UI, the UI, which is inheriting from the original library and overriding a few things so it will take care of the croquet stuff. And I challenge you to do it in Java. <laughs> so uh, that's kind of, so we'll skip how it works if anyone really wants to see the details, but I told you there was an interesting example of this. This is a really interesting example of this. And uh, we'll skip all that. And this is what we want to have. We want a platform that takes care of collaboration automatically. And I believe we can, because I'm sort of halfway there, but I don't know because I haven't gotten the whole thing to work. And the, the point is I need a way to save the model automatically, which it would be to save an image or something. Uh, can we support both asynchronous and synchronous uh, uh, reconciliation in the same system? I also have a theory about that, but it's just hand-waving. So again, the answer is I think so, but I don't know yet. That's where the research is. I hope to get there someday. Then there's other things, which is even closer to what uh, Vanessa does. Uh, see this picture? That is Newspeak running in, uh, in, uh, on an Oculus Quest, right? <coughs> that, that if you, those of you, if you have one, you'll recognize this is one of their scenes, right? This is, uh, uh, so, and it's, they have this curved floating monitor, and that's, you can sort of see that it's kind of a Newspeak browser. So, what if our markup language described 3D scenes? Now, there are people doing that, right? You can do that in HTML. There are libraries that extend it, and there are libraries that do HTML. So the experiment I haven't done yet, but again, on the future, is to, to get this editor. So the same model of editing, I will be editing the 3D scene. And yeah, all this thing has to work, and come back in four years at the rate I'm going. But Vanessa is doing all this for real, but in JavaScript, because, well, they want to actually make money. Um, which I'm a, I, I do too, but I do it in other ways. Uh, so what happens here? Well, if you do that, uh, documents are actually rooms in the metaverse. And the links are portals. And crossing a link is teleportation. That's kind of the, what happens when you have this. And that, that should be interesting. Now, Vanessa will show you probably all this actually working for real, solid, in, but in JavaScript. <laughs> uh, so uh, the idea here is that now we have the GUI is the GUI builder, is the editor, is the web page builder, is an ID and notebook, and is a metaverse bu builder, right? It's all the bloody same thing and should be under people's control. So that's, uh, that's the conclusion. You can start writing SMSs and end up building virtual worlds. You can start with unstructured code and you can evolve it. You can control it instead of them being sort of enslaved by, by Meta or Amazon or Google or whoever. And I believe, and I can be contradicted here but by at least one person, but I believe this is a direct continuation of the small talk tradition and vision in a way. And really all you ever needed was if your editor was done right, that would be it. It's all you ever wanted was a decent editor. Thank you. Let's do a five minute. <laughs>
Why, why do you think it's not here yet? I mean, you were talking about this for a long time, yeah. you said. Yeah. And it's not here yet. Yeah. Why do you think it's that? Because of us that we, d we have this uh, uh, tunnel vision and we don't yet? see the rest of the world? I think, I think that uh, obviously I am not uh, good at explaining or selling this stuff. People are not good at absorbing new things. Uh, you know, uh, somebody has to make it, uh, partly, yeah, it takes time to, to, to actually figure out how to do it and make it work is actually a hard problem yeah. and it requires funding and get, and if it's hard to explain ideas to people, explaining to them why they should give you money is even harder. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, I, I'm just not good at this. That's all I can tell you. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Well, yeah. You, said, you said you need an interim. Where do, you, uh, do, you, do I apply well, for that? Well, uh, that would be a start, right? What I need is five very top-notch, competent people and I can take over the galaxy. I okay. had them for about a year and a half uh, when we started the music program. Where can we apply? If, 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 you, if I don't have to pay you, you can apply right yes. now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll call you in two years. I need two years. Yeah, yeah. Things that happen at small talks. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone who wants to not get paid, see me. We have lots of openings. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Any other questions? Any other questions? Yeah. Yesterday, uh, in the, uh, you, you explained to us that uh, you wanted um, a development environment that could communicate with other software. So uh, my question is, is the platform the communication uh, place or uh, Actually, uh, it depends. But basically, there's a thing called, uh, like there's platform collections, right? There's platform JS. That is the way to communicate in, in, when in the web version on JavaScript. There could be, if you were running Newspeak on something else, there might be some other. Basically, it's the, the module that get, takes care of the FFI. There's, and, and of course, other modules may also, so the GUI module, of course, is, doing un, is talking to that under the skin because all of this turns into DOM nodes, right? So. One more. Do you remember the open doc? Yeah. Were, were you there? It's uh, I was there, yeah. The dinosaurs were still around. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I do. And remember. it failed. And it yeah, was a well. Concept. It's, it was a document within a document, and it was... Well, no, the, 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 this is the, the, the question, whether this model of documents, right? Newspeak is, is objects within objects. The documents, so far, they're transcluded. They're not actually, there's a whole question. How you do nesting is tricky. They did it wrong, honestly. Uh, right. we, can, we can get into old dessert, but yeah, you, because it gets very confusing if, you have, if, if this is not quite the way you want it. Right now, the documents are actually they're referencing another document, and that's called transclusion as opposed to actual embedding, copy-paste, whether there's scoping. There's scenarios where you do want the scoping to work that way, but we're not doing that because, yeah, it's, it's, it's bad. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.